Right. Okay, now let's, uh, let's move on to the next session. Uh, it's an uh, economic session, in particular about the economic policy issue in Japan. So we are really fortunate to be able to have uh, two distinguished speakers, Professor Tsutomu Watanabe from the University of Tokyo and the Professor Warwick Makibin uh, from the Austrian National University. Let me briefly introduce the first speaker, Professor Tsutomu Watanabe. Uh, Tsutomu graduated uh, from the University of Tokyo and uh, joined the Bank of Japan in 1982. And then he obtained a PhD in economics from Harvard University in 1992. Then uh, he became associate professor and a professor at the Hitotsubashi University in 1999. Then uh, since uh, 2011, he has been a professor of economics at the Faculty of Economics of the University of Tokyo. Uh, Storm has made a fundamental contribution in the monetary policy under the liquidity trap. So it's a bit of the terminology when the nominal interest rate is zero. Okay, his paper uh, published in a journal of money, credit, and the banking in two, now 2005 is uh, one of the most cited macroeconomics paper in the recent decade. And uh, the idea in that paper actually has been intensively used in a central banks which are facing the zero lower bound. So Tsutomu is among the first persons who created the concept of the so-called forward guidance. Oh, yeah. And also, Tsutomu has now been working intensively on uh, big data. And uh, in particular, a very interesting thing what he created is he started to publish the daily consumer price index. I'm sure he's going to talk about it. It's daily. You can see the consumer price index daily, okay? <laughs> okay, so that, that's great. So that, that kind of the data series now used in, uh, quite massively for many purposes, so marketing and policy issue of forecasting. And um, Stomu is considered to be the young leading scholar on academic research as well as policy issue. I must say he may not be very young in Australian standard, but it, indeed he is very young in the Japanese standard. <laughs> so many, including myself, are expecting him to play a major role in the policy making in a very near future. So I should stop here. And without a further ado, uh, pre, uh, please join me welcoming Professor Tom Watanabe. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for a very nice uh, and kind introduction to me. And probably I should not speak at all because it, that, that introduction was very nice. <laughs> and also, I'd like to thank the organizer, in particular Shiro, for um, making my trip to this country uh, possible. Thank you very much. And so th the topic of this uh, session is about abenomics. And my research interest is mainly on, on, on monetary policy and inflation, deflation. So in, in my talk, I, I will focus on, on the, some part of economics, which is deflation or, or, the, or the escaping from the deflation. And in my talk, I will tell, to give you some um, brief um, overview of what happened uh, over, the, uh, over the last two years. Economics started uh, at the end of 2000. Um, 2000 um, uh, 12, so it, it's, it's almost two years since then, and uh, I, I, I would like to give you a brief overview of what happened after the introduction of abenomics, and then finally I, I try to give my, my own thoughts on what, what's going on right now and what will happen in the near future. That's my, not my plan. Okay, so this is a um, chart describing Japanese uh, consumer price index, and uh, those blue lines represent a uh, year-on-year CPI inflation rate in Japan. If you look at, uh, in, in the 70s, we had a lot of inflation, uh, inflation rate of inflation reached more than uh, 20% in, 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 the, in, in the year of, say, like uh, 1974, something like that. And we had a bubble in the late 80s, so in, the, in this period, we had a housing bubble, and we had a burst of a bubble in the early 90s, and then prices started to decline, okay? So if you look at those figures, those blue lines, you can see that the rate of inflation in, in, the, in terms of CPI started to decline over time. And it, so this is a zero line, so deflation started somewhere around here. I mean, the, the, more specifically, deflation started uh, in 1995, okay? And if you look at the, um, those lines, 
blue lines, you can see that sometimes blue lines go above zero. However, basically, the blue line was below zero. So this, this is below zero and below zero. And it, it, in that sense, uh, we had a, a period of very long deflation. Okay? So deflation started somewhere around here, and it, it continued uh, all the way uh, to, the, to the very recent period. By the way, this is a period when Abenomics started. So we have a, a small but a positive number here, and uh, it, it, people started to say that we are very close to the end of depression. Okay? So, so this depression has two important characteristics, which has a very important <coughs> implic implication about uh, what happened in the future. The first thing is that the rate of depression was very, very small. If you look at, um, um, so this is zero, and this is minus five, minus five means uh, minus five percent per year. So you, you can see that the rate of depression was, uh, all, um, it's, it's, all, on average, was um, uh, one percent or less. Sometimes it, it reached uh, uh, two percent. This is uh, just after the uh, global financial crisis. But uh, in, uh, in, mo in most of the time, the rate of deflation was, uh, was less than one percent. So it was a very moderate deflation. It was not a very rapid deflation or free fall deflation. It was a moderate deflation. However, this deflation continued more than uh, 20 years. So it's a, it's a very persistent deflation. So those two features are very important characteristics of the, of the Japanese deflation. Uh, there is no um, particular, particularly good example of deflation in the recent period. However, if you go back to the history, there is a famous episode of depression in the U.S. during, during the Great Depression. And this is a C, uh, C, uh, U.S. CPI during that period. And you can see that this is a, a deflation during, during Great Depression. Um, during this period, the, the rate of depression was more than 8% per year. So it, uh, it was a very rapid and it was a very serious depression. Remember that our deflation was only 1% or less than 1%. However, the, 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 this period was very, very short. Actually, this um, deflation continued only three years. In, in contrast, in our case, depression continued more than 10 years or more than uh, 15 years. Okay? So, the, so in, in those two respects, deflation in our country is quite different from the depression during this period. Okay? So, um, so in some sense, um, the rate of deflation was very high in the U.S., and it was the, very, uh, the period was very short, which means that uh, prices declined sufficiently, then the economy started to recover. That's the kind of uh, message we can learn from here. However, in the case of Japan, the, because, because the rate of depression was very small, we need to, uh, more time to, to escape from the depression. That's the basic idea of what's going on right now. Okay, um, so given this um, kind of situation, um, a bit, a bit, uh, Prime Minister Abe started uh, a new policy uh, framework, which is often called Abenomics. Okay, that, that, was, that happened in, in, in December 2012. And there are three components. The first component is um, monetary policy, aggressive monetary, monetary easing. The second part is flexible fiscal policy. <coughs> Oh, as you already know, that, uh, that we have a, uh, Japan have a, have a huge public debt, so we have to do some f a fiscal reconstruction, and we, we need a, a very strong fiscal discipline. However, at the same time, we need to escape from depression. To do so, we need some stimulus from, from the fiscal side as well. So, that, so this, this, state, I'm sorry, this statement contains two aspects of fiscal policy. So that flexible means that uh, strong fiscal discipline as well as, uh, uh, as, well as a stimulus, uh, fiscal, fiscal stimulus to escape from the uh, liquidity trap and depression. And the third one is a, a growth, growth strategy to promote uh, private investment. So this is called, this is um, roughly speaking, uh, correspond to uh, to structure reform to, 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 to regain uh, potential growth. Okay? So, um, so, in my, so uh, uh, one thing I should mention here is that uh, those two, three um, policies, so each individual policy, of course, very important. However, the good thing was that uh, those policies were proposed as a package, not individual policies, but as a package. So this, in that sense, the uh, Abe tried to, um, to, to change, to, to, 
change his uh, people's mind so that uh, we, have, we, we, we can go into the new era without uh, depression. Okay, so, so in, um, um, the important thing is that uh, those three um, uh, policies was not, were not uh, individual policies, but uh, uh, proposed as a package. Okay, let, let me focus on the, on the monetary policy, uh, because uh, that, that's the main issue we, I, I like to talk about. So, um, at that, uh, so, <coughs> um, so, as I said, um, uh, Abenoni started uh, at the end of 2012, and uh, January 2013, um, um, there was a joint statement between the government and the Bank of Japan uh, to, to overcome deflation. And they, as they started something like an inflation targeting, and the Bank of Japan set the inflation target at 2%. I guess um, uh, 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 um, Governor Shirakawa visited uh, last year for this meeting, so he, he talked something about, uh, about uh, this post, because this was done by him. Okay? And uh, after, the, after this uh, um, decision, uh, unfortunately, he was forced to leave the office, and uh, new governor, uh, Governor Kuroda, started new policy. And that, was, that happened in, in April uh, 2013. And uh, here, um, 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 Bank of Japan started what we call QQME or QQE, a quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, which is very similar to the, to, uh, to the Q, QE or QE2 or QE3 in the US. Okay? And uh, to be more specifically, um, they announced that the BOJ will achieve the price stability target of 2%, because 2% was, uh, was the target set, set by, by, by in the past, so they try to achieve 2% inflation, and um, they, they will achieve it, although they, they committed to achieve it within two years. So two years is a key word, in some sense. And to do so, the, uh, the BOJ announced that they will uh, increase the money supply, and uh, actually they, will, uh, they say that they will double the money monetary base, and so that, uh, so, so that uh, uh, so the, 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 uh, there are a lot of money circulating in the economy, and that will create uh, upper, upper pressure on prices so that we can, we can escape from the pressure. That's the basic strategy they, 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 thought, they thought about. And to do so, they, they started to buy Japanese government bonds. Um, fortunately, we have a lot of, lot of government bonds in the market, so the, the, the BOJ can, can do the, this kind of policy. I heard that uh, there are not so many government bonds in this country, so maybe if, if, if you face a similar uh, problem as we did in the, in the past in Japan, then you cannot be able to um, uh, conduct something like QE in this country. But, uh, so anyway, we can do this. We, but uh, anyway, we, we were able to do this in, in Japan, and uh, people in the US were, were able to do the same thing. Okay, um, so, um, so so the basic strategy for the BOJ was to buy government bond, and, and, and uh, by doing that, they, they increase the money supply. So here I, I put, uh, uh, this is a, um, so this red line represents the monthly issue of JGB by the Ministry of Finance, okay? Uh, so this, this suggests that uh, uh, monthly issue is almost like a, a 14 trillion. Given that uh, our annual GDP is five trillion yen, this amount is not uh, is not uh, trillion. This is a monthly amount. Okay, so so, so, so the, that, that situation uh, continued before uh, long before uh, economic started, and uh, before uh, the new policy started by by the BOJ, the BOJ bought uh, about two trillion yen, two trillion GDP uh, per month. So this was uh, this was done by Governor Shinokawa. However, um, the, the Governor Kuroda started to buy JGB more, so he increased monthly purchase to up to uh, seven or eight trillion yen per, 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 per month. Okay. So um, roughly speaking, half of the JGB issued by the Ministry of Finance is purchased by the BOJ. Okay. Only the remaining half uh, are purchased by. by so um, you can see that th there are lots of dis distortion already. However, um, more seriously, uh, that uh, you know, pe uh, market participants, in particular banks, know that the BOJ will buy JGB a lot. 
So they are ex uh, anticipating that so when, when they go to the Ministry of Finance to, to buy government bonds from, from them, they, were, they, were, they are uh, anticipating that uh, BOJ will uh, repurchase it immediately. So actually, uh, so banks buy, buy bonds from the uh, Ministry of Finance, and probably one week or two weeks later, JGB buy it. So uh, in, in that sense, um, this is not a direct, BOJ does not make any direct transaction with the Ministry of Finance, how it is through the market. However, it's still um, something like a direct, direct purchase in the sense that uh, JGB prices are distorted significantly. So, um, of course, um, to escape from, from depression, we need a, a stimulus, and we need to increase um, uh, money supply. And to do so, we need to, the BOJ must, uh, need, must, uh, must buy a JGB. Uh, so this is, uh, in some sense, inevitable. However, this has a very bad effect on fiscal discipline. I have to say so. Okay. Um, and thanks to those efforts, prices and uh, the nominal variables started to increase and the, the situation is uh, uh, improving. And this is a time when Abenomics started, and, uh, and so this is, uh, this is uh, December 2012, and uh, blue line is uh, a nominal wage, and the red line is uh, CPI, the price of goods and services, and this is the nominal exchange rate, nominal, nominal yen rate exchange rate. Yen rate exchange rate started to uh, depreciate, so, so this is depreciation, <coughs> started depreciating just before the uh, abenomics actually started. Probably people st already anticipated that the new policy will be issued, new monetary easing will start immediately, and, uh, so, so that the uh, uh, yen started to depreciate um, even before the abenomics started. And if you, if you look at uh, uh, the exchange rate, it was somewhere 103, and then now it is uh, uh, very close to 100. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, something like uh, 80 or more, less than 80, and it is now almost, almost like 110. So there was a huge depreciation in the exchange, in the yen exchange. So this was a kind of um, uh, evidence for the, for, for the success of economics. And um, you can see the similar thing for, for um, good prices and uh, nominal wage. And uh, if you look at the CPI, CPI started to increase somewhere, uh, somewhere uh, uh, in some, uh, here in April 2013, and uh, uh, it increased significantly. And uh, this, this part, part of this increase uh, corresponds to the, to the um, increase in consumption tax. As I said, we had a serious uh, fiscal problem, so the government introduced, uh, I'm sorry, government uh, started uh, a consumption tax increase in the, uh, April of this year. So part of this increase in, in, in prices reflecting that, that, that consumption tax increase. And uh, you can also see that the nominal wage started to uh, go for that all the time. So every, um, I think those are the very important nominal variables. And all, all of those, those three variables started to show some, some, some improvement. And so this, those are the uh, very important things we have done to Okay. However, um, people are still um, very, very um, uh, kind of suspicious about the success of a And so this is, a, this is a taken from a, a consensus focus. And there are lots of uh, uh, think tanks and the banks and the other financial institutions which, which are making prediction, future prediction of, of, uh, of Japanese economic situation. And those um, predictions are collected by, by this, by this uh, company. And uh, they, 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 they provide a um, kind of average number of predictions. And if you look at the CPI, so, um, so the, now it is uh, um, uh, almost 1.5%. 1, 1. However, the, um, people in, in this survey expected that the CPI will be very close to 1%. So will be very close to 1%. Once we uh, exclude a uh, consumption tax increase. Okay, so red number represents the uh, uh, inflation rate without consumption tax increase. Okay. And if you see that it will continue to be around 1% over the, over, until, the, until the second quarter of 2016, which implies that, uh, as, I, as I said, um, 
the company Japan target is 2%. So they wanted to achieve 2% within two years, and but this uh, forecast means that uh, uh, people on average expect that the uh, economics will not be successful in terms of uh, increasing inflation. Okay, so, so the question, so that there is a big debate whether we should, uh, uh, we should go further or we should be uh, satisfied with this result. Oh, there's a, now, uh, current, currently, there is a big debate on, on what we should do. So, on, on what we should do. so my so my comment um, on this um, situation um, is um, uh, related uh, is about why the inflation rate is, is not so is not so so low, even even when, even though the the DOJ. Um, did a massive injection of money into the market, but why the inflation rate is still very low and far away from 2%? That's my, my question, okay? And there, I think uh, there are three um, important answers to, to that question. The number one is that um, um, we, need, so, um, we need a, a people, we need to people have a, a expectation about the inflation rate. And to, 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 uh, to be people, we need the people to uh, start to expect higher inflation in the future. In, uh, um, uh, in our terminology, we need a higher expected inflation for among people. And we did, um, so our uh, research team did some survey, um, <coughs> about which was collected from uh, about 20,000 consumers in Japan, and we calculated the fraction of consumers who expect the inflation to come with inflation to come within within the two years. Okay? And uh, on that, so overall so more than 70 percent um, people expect that the inflation will come. So this is a good sign. However, there's a huge difference between between generations. For example, if you look at uh, people under 29, uh, uh, only 60 percent of, of those people expect that the uh, inflation will come. On the other hand, if you go to the very old generation, they expect that the inflation is very surely to happen. And the difference is, um, my, our interpretation, or macroeconomic interpretation of this result, is that the inflation expectation is um, crucially depending on, 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 on the experience. For example, I have an um, undergraduate student who are, say, uh, 19 or 20 years ago, 10, 20 years old. And they know anything about, uh, they do know anything about inflation. When they were born, deflation was already, already started. And so this, this, their strategy to, to buy something is that uh, they have to wait as, as much as possible. Because price is just you know, declining, declining over time. So the best strategy for them, so it's a couple that they, they want to buy a new, new PC, and the best strategy for them is to wait as much as possible. So that's uh, you know, that their basic uh, uh, behavior. And, and uh, because they do, did not experience any inflation in their life, they, it is very hard for them to, um, um, uh, ex um, it is very hard to, for them to imagine, where, in, in which, uh, imagine the economy in which uh, inflation rate is uh, uh, positive rather than negative. So that is why uh, both young people are, are very, so those so young people uh, still um, um, expect that the depression will continue. On the other hand, the, the, the generation like, uh, like me, I'm now in the 50s, and uh, I know some um, knowledge about, personal knowledge about uh, uh, high inflation rate in, in, in the 70s, uh, due to the oil crisis and so on. So it, it's very high, uh, uh, um, easy for me to, to ima imagine that the inflation will happen in the future. And my grandmother, uh, they know that uh, there was a huge, huge inflation just after the, uh, immediately after the uh, World War II. So it, they are very easy to believe that the inflation will happen in the future. So there are huge difference among the generation in terms of uh, uh, expected inflation. Probably uh, um, uh, Governor Kuroda and the, uh, um, and the Prime Minister Abe uh, made some message to all to those old generations because those, those old generations have uh, access to um, um, information uh, from the Governor Kuroda or from the 
from uh, the Prime Minister Abe. However, those young people are not so much interested in economic issues, uh, in particular economic issues announced by the, announced by the DOJ and, uh, and the government. So probably the government and um, come to Japan should more to, should more um, should provide more information or more message to those young young generation so that they they can they can start to think about the possibility of inflation in the future. And the second thing is that <coughs> the, the first thing is about first thing about, about uh, consumers and the second thing is about, about the farms. Okay. Farms in some uh, uh, industries, like a uh, like service industry, in particular, say, haircuts, and they do not expect price increase at all, and uh, so that they do not change prices at all. Uh, CPI, Japanese CPI, consists of more than uh, 500 items. So I, I, here I, I, I draw a uh, graph uh, for, for the distribution of price, uh, distribution of inflation rate for each item, for each individual item, for the, for the, for the 500, 500 items. And we did the same thing for the U.S. And uh, um, March 2014, this is the, the month for, for, for this graph. In, in this particular month, our inflation rate was 1.3% uh, and the U.S. rate was 1.5%. So average inflation rate was almost the same here between the two, two countries. However, if you look at the distribution, uh, then there is a huge difference between the two countries. In the U.S., most farms uh, increase prices about some, somewhere around two percent. So for them, um, so, so, so uh, for U.S. farms, it is um, very common to increase prices every day by two or three percent per year. And what goes, of course, for, um, if some farm has a very special uh, problem, they, they increase prices more or they in increase prices less. So there, there, there is a um, distribution here. However, however, important thing is that uh, 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 most farms increase prices uh, by, by, two, by two or three percent per year. On, in, in contrast, for the, the, this, this blue line in Japan, uh, in contrast, uh, for Japanese farms, most Japanese farms um, do not change at all. So this is zero. It means that uh, they do not change prices at all. And um, th th those farms, are particularly from, uh, from, from service sectors, the service sectors are reluctant to change prices at all. That is why this, this kind of situation uh, continues uh, uh, even after the government started. And so, so this is a big difference, and the <coughs> difference, we, can, we can see the similar difference between Japan and Canada. I'm sorry, I have no uh, data for, for Australia, but probably you will find a similar result between Japan and <coughs> And the third thing is uh, consumption tax increase. Again, uh, so, so, uh, um, consumption tax increase means that uh, uh, decline in the okay? So that was, of course, expected. So there was a big discussion about uh, what we should do about the consumption tax. Uh, that, that debate happened uh, last year. And the conclusion uh, made by the uh, Prime Minister Abe was that uh, we are able to overcome the uh, decline in, in, in their income because the consumers are, are very um, strong in, in their cons cons consumption behavior so that we can, we can overcome the uh, increase in consumption tax. That was uh, discussed in, in last year. However, so this is the April of this year, consumption tax, tax, tax increase by, by 3%. So the red line is, is, uh, is for this year. And you can see that uh, at the beginning, uh, prices increased uh, more than 3.5%. So this was a very good start. So people were very happy to see, to, to see this kind of thing. In particular, uh, people in the, in the government, uh, people in the BOJ the were very much, uh, much happy to, to see this. However, over time, inflation rates uh, decline, 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 and it is now about 2.5%, uh, about, uh, which is, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, less than uh, increase in consumption tax. So uh, in, that, in that sense, um, it got, so, um, uh, decline in, 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 the, in the CPI or in, in, the, in the price level, it was uh, an, an unanticipated 
And we had a very bad experience in 1997 when uh, consumption tax was increased from 3% to 5%. So uh, in the debate, which, which happened last year, the most important issue was to avoid this kind of failure. However, uh, as far as uh, um, uh, we see uh, um, uh, um, here, uh, we, 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 we see that the pattern is almost the same. Uh, um, these two events, which, mean, which is a um, um, uh, very surprising thing to researchers as well as, uh, as uh, uh, policy makers, and that is why they, they started to think about um, uh, think, think, think about uh, uh, whether they think about whether they should avoid a consumption tax increase, which is uh, planned next year. And uh, some people, I would, I would say, 50 percent of people say that. Uh, Given this uh, failure in, in, in April, we should not uh, do the same thing next year. That's uh, 50 percent, and uh, another 50 percent say that uh, because we our our fiscal, fiscal discipline is very important, if we cancel the consumption tax increase uh, for the next year, then it is a very bad signal to the to the market participants, in particular the market uh, in, in the particular uh, foreign uh, participants who are interested in uh, JGP. So we should not. Um, uh, we should not um, stop uh, consumption tax increase next year. So, so there is a still, there is still, uh, um, go, there is a still going on big debate on this issue, and probably Prime Minister must make uh, some decision uh, uh, until the end of this year. So uh, let me stop my, my presentation here, and I'd like to uh, hear your view or opinions on, on, on what, what's happening in Japan in terms of people. Thank you very much. Oh, I forgot to, to mention myself. I'm not a stranger just popping in. So I'm uh, Ife Fujiwara, uh, co-director of the Australian Japan Research Center. But actually, I'm like a, a head of the Tokyo branch office of Australian Japan Research Center, where the, I'm the only local member. OK, so uh, next presenter is the Professor Warwick McKibbin. Maybe no need, to, no, need, no need for the introduction, because everybody knows Warwick. And, uh, what we can know that uh, is one of the most influential and the famous macroeconomists in Australia. And uh, Warwick has been in uh, numerous honorable positions, such as uh, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Science, a distinguished fellow of the Asia and the Pacific Policy Societies, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institutions, foundation director of the ANU Center for Applied of Macroeconomic Analysis, foundation director of the ANU Research School of Economics, I need to continue to maybe more and more. And I'm um, a professional fellow at the Lowry Institute for International Policy, a member of the Austrian Prime Minister's Science, Engineering, and Innovation Council, and a member on the panel on the, on the Austrian Prime Minister's Task Force on Uranium Mining, Processing, and the Nuclear Energy in Australia, and has served for a decade on the board of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Have I covered it? Huh? <laughs> OK, thank you. So that, and, uh, Warwick also has a PhD in economics from Harvard University. So if you disagree to their presentation, maybe Harvard to be blamed. So that. <laughs> and uh, Warwick made a fun fundamental contributions in open economy modeling. Yeah, his model, together with Jeffrey Sachs, known as the sachs mckibbin model, has been the core of the open economy model used in many policy institutions. Also, Warwick is among the first person to create the concept of the monetary policy rule. And he created that kind of the idea in the late 1980s. Monetary policy rule is at the core of the monetary th theory and the policy in academics as well as in practice. So the, we are really fortunate today we have a, you know, two distinguished speakers who have a great knowledge about the academics as well as the policy experiences. So without further ado, Warwick. Please join me in welcoming Warwick. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ife, for that very generous introduction. Let me make one correction. He's actually called the McKibben Sachs Global Model. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, in Japan, I do admit it is called the Sachs McKibben Model. Um, it's a great honour to be here. Thank you to the organisers for inviting me back for a, uh, a return visit because uh, I performed last year. And it's a particular honour to be on a panel with Professor Watanabe, who is one of the leading monetary economists uh, around today. And uh, it's a great pleasure to follow his presentation. Um, 
my interest in Japan uh, began in 1984 when I was a graduate student at Harvard and I was working with Naoko Ishii from the Ministry of Finance to put Japan into the McKibben Sachs global model. And I, I found Japan was a fascinating country, a fascinating society, but a particularly interesting economy for macroeconomists because when you look at Japan, the big issues that have occurred in Japan have been about a decade ahead of those issues appearing in other countries around the world. And so we've learned a lot from the Japanese experience about how to respond and how not to respond to some pretty big issues. So to give you an example, when I arrived at the Ministry of Finance in 1986, which is when I wrote my book with Jeffrey Sachs, he was at the Bank of Japan, um, the big debate in Tokyo was why was the palace in Tokyo valued at the same or more than the entire state of California. And there were some pretty interesting arguments as to why this might be the case. To some of us, this seemed like a bubble, and it did turn into a bubble. And we saw what happened in the early 90s when the bubble collapsed. And then we saw a period of deflation, as Professor Watanabe has talked about. Deflation and how to respond to that was a big issue in Japan. And my American colleagues at the time would go to these conferences in Tokyo and they'd sort of be curious, but they actually didn't think it was relevant. And now we see today this debate is a big issue, particularly in Europe, but also potentially in the US. The third issue is how Japan has gone through the demographic transition before other countries, perhaps not before Italy, but well ahead of other countries. And this is a situation where not only is the workforce declining, but also the population is declining. And this has dragged down the potential growth rate in Japan very, very significantly. The final point is, Japan was at the leadership of fiscal undiscipline. Look at fiscal debt in Japan, gross debt is 240% of GDP. Now in any other society, this would be creating a fiscal crisis, but in Japan, the debt is held by Japanese citizens and corporations and the central bank. And so we haven't seen the implications of the, co the consequences of that experience, but we do have a leading runner in the world to see what happens when the world shifts to a world of higher interest rates when you have such high uh, fiscal debt. So that's an introduction because I think, again, what we understand from Japan is going to be very important for our societies and the global economy going forward. Um, the question I was asked was, will Abenomics work? My answer is, it should in theory. <laughs> but my guess, being a very close watcher of Japanese um, policy making, I think it probably won't. And I think it won't, not because the economics is flawed or the idea is flawed, or Japan might be a different economy. It's because the politics probably will undermine it as it has in Japan over the, the last 20 years. And this afternoon session, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. But let's go, through, um, let's go through a bit more detail about what I think are the key aspects of abenomics. Um, there are serious risks because in our research and many, many Japanese scholars, the key of the, the entire program is there has to be credibility of future policy adjustments. So the government's commitment to fiscal discipline is absolutely key. The timing, the sequencing of the monetary, the fiscal and the reform is absolutely critical. And you cannot consider what will happen in Japan without taking the global concept, uh, context. That is, what is the rest of the world doing while Japan is exercising this experiment? And there's some serious, serious economic risks about to explode in the world economy, and this will have serious ramifications for Japan. So, Professor Watanabe has always ta already talked about the three arrows, but let me just re re reinforce that. The first is a massive monetary stimulus, both to raise in the short term uh, in, uh, demand, but also to importantly raise inflation in the future. The idea here being to get the real interest rate to fall as a stimulus. The second is a fiscal stimulus. This is what Professor Watanabe talked about in terms of flexible fiscal policy. That is a fiscal stimulus in the short run, but a very, very credible fiscal contraction in the future to bring, to stabilise the debt to GDP ratio at 240% of GDP, but then to bring it down to say 60% of GDP, which is probably a more reasonable figure. And then to embark on major structural reforms that will increase the potential growth, growth rate of the economy. And there's two components of this. There's a very big push on increasing labour force participation, particularly among women, because there is a great capacity for expansion there. And the second is to liberalise the economy so you get higher economic growth. In a world of enormous debt, the debt to GDP ratio needs to have both high growth to bring down the debt to GDP ratio, 
and lower debt. And all of these components are absolutely critical. So the goal then of the policy is to jumpstart the economy, so you push the economy in the short term, and then you start doing all the difficult things. And hopefully the timing is that those difficult things will be in place when the economy starts go, uh, slowing down from the jumpstarting. And again, the jumpstarting should then push into growth coming from structural reform, growth coming from labour force participation, and very importantly, and not many people consider this critical, but I consider it absolutely critical, the reason why many countries don't have strong investment, part of the reason, is because there's this unknown future tax burden with these very large fiscal deficits and debt. So countries don't, firms don't know what to invest in because if they think they will make a profit, then they're going to be losing that in, in the form of future tax. Mining tax in Australia is an example of, of how not to design a policy that in principle is a very good idea. Now, a lot of scholars have looked at this policy. In the early 2000s, there was actually a series of conferences sponsored by the Cabinet Office in the International Collaborations Projects and other places. And one of the papers I presented at the Asian Economic Panel was basically taking the ideas of all the Japanese economists and putting them together and looking at the three components. An increase in expected inflation, we modelled 3%, not 2%. Uh, a credible fiscal consolidation and a big economic reform package. So we actually did the analysis. I, I presented some of it last year. I'll just talk to you through what we learned from that to understand why things are actually not working now. So on monetary policy, again, big quantitative easing of monetary policy. Two components here, increase expected inflation. So if everybody believes inflation is higher and the nominal interest rate is still low, the real interest rate will fall and that will encourage people to, to um, expand. And also it will tend to give a boost to the, to, to the stock market. And Professor Watanabe's numbers suggest that in fact, yes, the stock market did go up and there was a movement in inflation, although not as large as was hoped. Um, a key part of the whole story though was a big depreciation of the yen. And as you saw, we've seen the big depreciation of the yen. What this does is it stimulates net exports. So while you're pushing on the domestic demand, you're also pushing on foreign demand and all this demand should give the Japanese economy a, a, an increase in growth. And very importantly in the background, by getting inflation up and getting the real growth rate to rise, you're raising the nominal growth rate by even more and the debt to GDP ratio is normally nominal debt divided by nominal GDP, so that helps with the fiscal sustainability. So it's a, it's a pretty good idea to do this. Now the trouble is, when you model it, and I think most macroeconomists would agree, this monetary policy doesn't fix the long run problems. It fixes you for maybe two, three years, depending on the rigidities in the economy, but excess liquidity doesn't fix real problems, it postpones them. And so we're seeing in the beginning only this part of the policy really in place. And if you look at the cross, the, the spillovers to other countries, in fact, this sort of monetary adjustment, although big for Japan, has offsetting forces, and so it actually doesn't really do much to the rest of the region in terms of changing competitiveness because you have exchange rate changes which make Japan more competitive but you have a surging Japan economy which increases the demand for exports from the region so these things actually aren't a con shouldn't be a concern for the region, particularly Australia. Now let's look at the second component, that is the fiscal consolidation. Um, it's pretty clear that if you start cutting fiscal policy, cutting deficits by tax increases or spending cuts, that you're going to slow down the economy in the short term. But if you have very deep cuts in the future, that credible reduction in debt and credible reduction in future taxes can bring down the long-term interest rate and it can actually stimulate in the short term just to offset the cuts that are initially in place. So if you get this right and it's credible, you can get the benefits of the credibility while you're managing the short-term adjustment. And again, this was hopefully, if this is credible, will stimulate investment. And once you do a fiscal contraction and increase government savings, our estimate is some of that savings flows overseas and it further brings down the value of the yen. So again, getting this credible consolidation in with the monetary adjustment gives you a fairly substantial improvement in the economy. The third component, structural reform, is important because you encourage labour force participation so you can increase the growth rate of the economy through more people in the economy and if you reform sufficiently in the key sectors, and here I think it's more services than energy and agriculture, which is where the government is focused, but wherever it is, if you can increase productivity growth in an economy with a debt overhang, um, you should be able to raise investment, raise potential growth, and everything should smoothly move into a new equilibrium after a, uh, a decade. Now again, in terms of what this does to the rest of the world, 
it's positive because a strong Japan, a well-functioning Japan, it's a large economy and its spillovers will be positive through this mechanism of more trade and more growth. So again, the Japanese experiment is very important for Japan, but it's also important for a world which is uh, insufficient economic growth. Now the key points from this, these three components, is these can work, and they do work in, in models, but models are just models, but the timing is critical. If you get the sequence wrong or you don't do the entire sequence, then you, you can see a, a, a real problem. The fiscal consolidation has to be credible, and that's absolutely important because if it's not, then as the government cuts, that demand will leave the economy and the slowdown will be greater. You need to have the future benefits of the lower future tax liability. Monetary stimulus, again, is only temporary, and most of it's coming through the yen, and the real value of the yen will go back to where it was after a number of years. And so the fiscal reforms need to bring down the real value of the yen permanently by reducing the debt. But in the short term, you only get the real depreciation coming through the monetary, but that goes away. And hopefully, that all these adjustments are occurring just as the economy is slowing from the monetary stimulus, and just as the big fiscal cuts are really starting to cut into aggregate demand, hopefully the reform process has generated a surge in economic growth and you get on to this new, this new Japan. Now, the current problems are, is there's almost no third arrow. In terms of the reform process, it still hasn't been adopted. So we've got, since the beginning of 2013, we're now in 2014, we've had 18 months of the monetary injection and we still don't have either a, a credible fiscal adjustment or um, the, the economic reform. So we have the stimulus in place. We have had a, a fiscal consolidation that's been predicted and, and announced, but is that actually not credible so far? And we, Professor Watanabe already talked about what happened with the consumption tax. It had a large negative impact on demand. Well, that's not surprising because in Australia, when we did the GST in 2001, consumers brought forward to the present their consumption before the tax. So when the tax hit, they didn't have any spending in that period, and so you had exactly the same experience that Japan had when they did the first consumption tax experiment, and when they did the second, the one just recently in April this year. So this is not surprising. Um, what, what I think the answer to that is not to just do a one-off and see what happens. It's to do one and then have a credible announcement that there'll be a sequence of consumption tax increases as far as the eye can see, so you don't create these holes. You do create the forward shifting to the, the, to the present, which gives you a demand stimulus today, but you don't get the whole later on because people aren't expecting the next consumption tax increase. And so it's important, I think, in the design to have this credible consumption tax profile. So the experiment is still unfolding. I mean, that's the, the issue here. It's, it's, it's not that we can sit back and say, well, did it work? Because it's only just begun. And there is a global context. The global context is the US is just about to end quantitative easing. US interest rates will be rising probably from early next year. World interest rates will probably be rising from early next year. There will be a big reallocation of global capital flows in response to this. There will be fragility in the emerging economies. And Japan is undertaking this experiment in that context where there's likely to be a Eurozone crisis at any moment, which will be a crisis of fiscal and sovereign wealth, sovereign debt. And Japan is sitting there exposed with the largest sovereign debt in the world. So that, to me, is a potential problem. Um, but the good news is that some of this capital that's leaving Europe hopefully will go into Japan and hopefully will help with the investment recovery in response to the policies that have been, that have been put in place. But there is this issue of the debt overhang that I mentioned. So what are, what are the lessons from Japan? Um, it's important for the world that economic works, economics works. The reason it's important is because Japan is important. If economics works, it's a big economy and this will have economic benefits. But also the demonstration effect that in fact you can get yourself out of a hole created by bursting bubbles, deflation, demographic, demographic decline and fiscal extravagance means that other countries will then learn what policies are needed to do the same thing. And even if it doesn't work, it's going to be important that we learn why it doesn't work. Because in fact, it is a reasonable approach in theory and it works beautifully well in my model. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the model is correct. And that's my website. Thank you. Again, thank you for the a fantastic presentation. So now is the time to have uh, questions from the participants.
Okay, could you go first? Could you tell, the, tell your name first? And the microphone, oh, Kaisei. Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> and you. You will, next, you will be the next. Hi, Naomi Fink of Europe Pacifica Consulting. I have two questions, uh, both for Professor Watanabe. The first one is regarding, uh, regarding structural reform and uh, the nature of deflation. Firstly, it's agreed that reflation is not a goal in its own right, but necessary to accomplish everything else, notably the structural reforms that will bring uh, potential growth back. However, there may be a need at one point, BOJ has no real incentive to recognize it now, but at one point there may be a need to distinguish between the damaging type of inflation, the deficit of demand, and good deflation. In my own models, I ha in my own simulations, I have calculated that investment-specific technology, a type of deflation, is responsible for about 30% of total factor productivity growth since the 1970s. So my first question is, how do we actually gauge, once we've gotten to the place where we want to be, how the exit works and how we don't, and how not to kill this good deflation? My second question is precisely about inflation expectations that both professors Watanabe and McKibben mentioned. Um, as I, I suppose it's uh, the inflation expectations are instrumental in achieving reflation. Um, as uh, Professor McKibben mentioned, what we get is a, uh, a rise in the expectations which lowers the real interest rates uh, and then that, uh, that facilitates an exit. However, it really occurs to me, especially when talking to market participants, that we really have a very bad grasp of inflation expectations. The JGBI market is all but moribund. The BOJ right now is the, the biggest buyer. Um, in fact, it seems that the, this idea of a daily CPI might be one of the very key factors in uh, engaging these inflation expectations properly because as we know, central banks don't influence current inflation but expectations of inflation in the future. Is it possible to use this daily CPI to come up with a forecast, especially since we know the composition, the generational composition of the autocorrelation factors? Can we come up with a viable forecast that can assist in policy making? Those are my two questions. Uh, thank you very much for very nice uh, questions. And uh, um, the first question is about the um, um, relationship between deflation and the structural reform. That, that's my understanding. And um, um, I, I didn't say anything about uh, structural reform in my presentation. The way I understand the relationship between the two is as follows. Uh, when deflation was, happen was going on, and, and, and of course, interest rate was very close to zero which means that the most, um, the most reliable asset is money. So consumers put their, their, their saving in, in the form of money, and also the same, uh, same thing is true for farms. Farms put their, their um, funds in the form of money. So consumers and farms do, did not take any risk taking, did not, take, did, did not do any risk taking in, in, in that period. That is why we need to escape from deflation. The deflation, is, as I said, deflation itself is not so serious. It is a deflation only about 1% per year. So it's not a killing deflation. But however, um, deflation has a very bad effect on people's activity in terms of risk taking. So we need to um, uh, destroy that kind of bad behavior by escaping from deflation. And that is a very good um, thing for, for even for fiscal, uh, for, um, uh, structural reform. It is very easy to con con uh, conduct uh, structural reform given that inflation rate is positive. It is very hard to do that if, when inflation rate is negative. Because if I think about uh, wages and so on, during the deflation period, they are declining. So in, the, in, that, sense, in that case, it is hard to do some big, uh, uh, big, big, big structural reform in the labor market because uh, adjustment in the nominal wage is very, very limited. However, we, if we have inflation, positive inflation, then uh, structural reform in the labor market may be much more easier. 
That's the key idea of behind Abenomics. That is why they, they started, they started uh, monetary easing first, and they tried their best to escape from deflation. And then after that, they, they, go, they, they plan to go to uh, structural reform. Uh, unfortunately, at this moment, uh, structural reform is not, uh, is not going well, but so, as, 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 uh, as uh, Professor Mackey mentioned. So, but still, we need to uh, do something more I, I hope that the government will do mo mo something more uh, to, to, to achieve um, uh, more uh, higher uh, uh, productivity and uh, and uh, and be, but uh, let me emphasize that before do that we need to de escape from depression that's that's my point another the second question is about expectation inflation expectations and uh, um, uh, yeah um, and uh, you, you mentioned that uh, my uh, our index, uh, our daily index, may be uh, useful to 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 make to 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 make some um, uh, prediction about the future inflation rates. Yes, that that is true. And actually, people started to use our um, uh, daily inflation rate to to expect what happened in, in the in the CPI inflation rate. That's a good thing for, even for for us. Okay, and. Um, as I said, at the beginning of this April, we had a, a consumption tax increase on, on, in, in, in April, and they, people are very much interested in how much consumption tax increase will, will be uh, passed through to the to prices. So they are uh, quite interested in what happened in the CPI. However, the CPI released only in, 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 in late, late May, so the people are not able to wait until the end of, in, end of May. How, uh, uh, in that circumstance, our daily index was available April 3rd, so they, can, they were able to check whether the pass-through was enough or not. And what, what, they, what, was, what they found was that the pass-through was very high, so that was a, a very big, a, big, a good signal to, to the monetary policy uh, making. However, after that, as I, as I mentioned in my, my, my presentation, um, uh, our dairy index started to decline. Unfortunately, that, that created negative impact on, on people's expectation. People now started to worrying ag again about the resurgence of uh, deflation rather than the higher inflation. So, Yes, um, our daily index affected people's expectation, but was not uh, that, 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 that the way it, it affected people's expectation was not so, so good at, 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 at this moment. And so, um, uh, unfortunately, probably our daily uh, inflation rate may be a, a very uh, good predictor of the f future CPI inflation, and uh, um, probably in the future, so I, I, my, our expectation is that uh, in November or December, um, CPI will start to decline again, unfortunately. And then the government and the uh, BOJ must think about seriously about, uh, about, uh, about the next uh, step uh, um, in terms of monetary policy stimulus. Can yeah. I just add, I just wanted to add one important in, um, comment to that. Um, I think there is a misperception in the question, which is quite dangerous, and that is, you talk to you talk to particularly Bank of Japan people, but also other Japanese economists. They blame the deflation in Japan on the fall in the price of Chinese manufacturing goods because of productivity growth in China. Now, to me, and it's implicit in your comment about um, in, uh, ITC investments, that's a relative price change in the economy. That's not a monetary phenomenon. Inflation doesn't come from those relative price changes. It comes from monetary policy. Central banks can create inflation. They can't control these changes in relative prices. So the good news is if you, can, if you have, and as Professor Watanabe said, if you have this structural reform, you will get those relative price changes. You will get a lot of innovation in some sectors where the relative prices of those goods will go down. But hopefully there'll be a lot bigger price increases in other parts of the economy. And that, ge that generates a, a transfer to the producers and the, and, the, and the workers in those industries. And so the idea is not to focus on just the cost side of the economy, it's to focus on the pro inflation and demand side of the economy at the same time. So it's very important that people don't misunderstand these relative price shocks as being anything to do with inflation. I think they're not, if you respond very quickly to them. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question is... Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm Bosworth from the ANU. Uh, Thank you for the presentations, I enjoyed them very much. Um, I guess my question is mainly directed at Warwick. Um, 
I understood very clearly Warwick, what you were saying and I basically agree with you in terms of the standard theory that you've outlined that economics is, is based on. But as part of that, it seems to me that it, uh, it hinges on the application of the Mundell-Fleming model between the links between fiscal policy, monetary policy, interest rates, capital flows and exchange rates. And, uh, and I'm a strong believer of the Mundell-Fleming model and but as you know, Treasury has just recently put out a paper saying that uh, the Mundell-Fleming model uh, didn't apply in Australia over the GFC years and hence that was a problem that made managing uh, the, the GFC much more difficult. So I guess my question to, to you is, if Treasury is right in the Australian case and the Mundell-Fleming model didn't, didn't apply, then isn't it possible also that the Mundell-Fleming model may not apply in Japan and therefore if that's the case then there's quite significant implications on the standard macroeconomic theory that's outlined that uh, abenomics is, is based on. So I'd be interested to hear your views both in the Japanese context but also in terms of the Australian context in relation to what Treasury has recently said. Thank you. Um, can I just check on the Chatham House rules and the journalists in the audience? <laughs> Anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so I think Treasury's wrong on this. I think they were wrong at the time. I testified at the time in the Senate, I'm using my framework. They were right in the sense that, see, the argument here is when a country acts alone and you combine monetary and fiscal policy together, uh, you get a very powerful effect of monetary policy because the exchange rate depreciates. But the fiscal effects get washed out because the exchange rate appreciates. That's the argument. If you expand the fiscal deficit, capital will flow in to finance it, the exchange rate will appreciate and your exports will fall. Now in the context of the financial crisis, that whole debate flips upside down because if all countries expand fiscal policy together, then the exchange rate effects disappear. And so when the government spends more, it's a bigger stimulus than if a country did it by itself. So where I agree with Treasury is the global coordinated stimulus that was done in 2009-10 that actually stimulated all the economies in the world. So it did have a role in offsetting the crisis. But anything that was done above the world average fell back into the, closed econ the open economy single country model. As you expanded more, that demand didn't go into the domestic economy, it drove the exchange rate. That demand went into China from Australia. That demand went into Europe, it went into the US. So my argument, and I think where the subtleties are lost, is that, yes, we should have had a stimulus, but it should not have been the second biggest in the world. It should have been the average, and that's what the IMF had advocated, and we went well above that. So the first stimulus was right, half of the second stimulus was right, the rest of the second stimulus was wrong, and the timing was messed up because the composition of buildings and a whole bunch of things that took years to implement was wrong. So it's a subtle debate, but the clear repudiation of, of the Mundell Fleming that was in a particular press release is poor economics. And what about in the Japan situation? And Japan, I think Mundell Fleming works, although it, you've got to be careful because you've got a zero lower bound issue in the background in Japan that we didn't have in Australia. Now, that's a problem, uh, that can be a problem if you don't get the expectations mechanisms working because you actually can't cut the nominal interest rate. You only can get a cut in the real interest rate through the expectation. And the whole issue, I mean, where this could break down, well, even my analysis, is it's the expectations that matter. And that is to do with psychology, and that is to do with a whole bunch of things which could turn out totally differently to what we predict, particularly in a confusing world in which we live, where everybody has got their own pet theories of why economics has failed and there's some new theory about an alternative. That's the risk we face. I'd go back and stick to the fundamentals and and look at the work of Professor Watanabe and a whole bunch of serious economists who understand these particular differences across countries. Yeah. Okay. So the next, please. So we have already have uh, you know lots of requests for the question. So could you make it a bit shorter? Yes. Uh, my name is Akira Imamura from Embassy of Japan. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent presentations. One question to Professor Watanabe. One uh, question to Professor McKibben. Um, Professor Watanabe, my question is about your prediction on current dip in consumption. How long will it continue? Because uh, the government of Japan and BOJ still uh, thinks that dip is uh, relatively uh, short-term 
phenomenon after the rise of the consumption tax, and we're hoping to see the uh, positive cycle starts after the increase of the uh, huge increase in corporate revenue last year or this uh, last fiscal year, and then uh, that led seemingly to a rise of the income, as well as uh, you know the uh, decrease in uh, 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 unemployment rate because of this. Uh, uh, historically very low rate of uh, job applicants uh, ratio. So um, how, how do you think about that cycle will start uh, positively and how that will that uh, uh, end, hopefully, that this dip in consumption? And my question to uh, Professor McGibbon is about the, uh, the points you made on the uh, uh, three arrows. Uh, first about uh, a third arrow, you said about, uh, you said that almost no third arrow I think, as you rightly said, we are very keen on job participation and other structural reforms. So I think I would say we have made a significant step forward in terms of uh, declar declaratory steps. Yep. Maybe you can say that the, uh, the uh, significant impact from structural reform efforts have not been so visible yet. But by nature, structural reform takes a lot of time, and uh, I think uh, um, uh, at this point, uh, you, we should really look at how uh, ambitious uh, the policy declarations were, were uh, yeah. made uh, so far. And, and um, the uh, fiscal uh, uh, credibility is not uh, so visible so far, you made that point. Uh, but the, the fact of the uh, March rise, of the, or the April rise of the consumption tax itself is a kind of credible step toward yes. fiscal discipline. And I see people in opinion polls, they support uh, the f further increase of con uh, consumption tax because they look at the uh, 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 more credible social uh, security network or net. And that's the uh, uh, end of US QE. Uh, will, won't that affect, uh, 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 impact even lower uh, or further depreciation of yen? and? increase the uh, viability of Japanese uh, economy. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, very, um, question about the consumption tax increase. Um, um, let, me, let, let me clarify a little bit about, uh, about this issue. And I, I said in my presentation that the effect on, of consumption tax increase uh, this April was uh, unanticipated. Unanticipatedly large, and he, um, Ma Professor Markibin, said that it was uh, uh, anticipated. Okay, and uh, anticipate. Of course, it, it, uh, the tax tax change was anticipated, and the people started by something in in March before the tax consumption uh, before the consumption tax increase um, <coughs> implemented. So they 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 um, bought a lot of uh, say durables in in March. And because they, they, they bought too much in March, and then uh, in, in April or in May, they d d do not have a, a, any reason to spend more in, in those periods. That is, that is why uh, decline in consumption, in some sense, are, are, are expected, okay? And also, um, it was another unexpected part of, of this experiment was that uh, uh, real income, um, the real income means the nominal wage divided by uh, CPI. And CPI increased by, by uh, at least three percent by the increase by, due to the increase of uh, consumption tax increase. And so, it, so the real income decline is, is also was also not anticipated. And, and was not uh, the income, uh, income increase was uh, anticipated. So th those two things were anticipated. Okay. However, what was not anticipated was that. Uh, um, even for, for non-durables, consumption declined substantially in, 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 in April and May. And so think about, so we are uh, collecting data for, for, from supermarkets to, to construct a daily index, so something, something like a shampoo or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, some other food, and food items and so on. So those are not, so in, in some sense, they are st still durable, but uh, they cannot store those things uh, in, in, in their small houses. So usually th 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 those items are not, not, not so much storable. So we are uh, an uh, anticipating that the consumption will not decline so much even in, in, in April or even in May. However, it declines substantially. 
and that created the firm's behavior to reduce their prices. That is, uh, that is another reason why we had uh, the resurgence of deflation in our data set. And uh, the reason why we, we made a mistake in this, in this respect probably was that um, we misunderstand people's expectation about future inflation rate. We, so there, there are several surveys conducted by BOJ and the government, all of them suggesting that uh, uh, people started to expect very high inflation rate in the future. So we, we saw that expected inflation has already been very, very high. And given this kind of uh, um, understanding, we expect that uh, uh, consumption in, 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 in uh, April, in, in, in May, must be very strong. However, probably uh, co co consumers expected inflation was not that high. That, so so that, that is why uh, consumers started to stop uh, 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 increased consumption in, in, in April and May. So, that implies that um, the whole big whole structure of abenomics may not be uh, so good at, at this moment, given in, in the sense that uh, uh, consumers do not have a very high expected inflation. So we need to re-establish um, the high expected inflation. Otherwise, uh, abenomics as a whole will not be will not be uh, uh, will not be a big failure. So, uh, so that, that's that's the way we try to understand what happened after the uh, consumption tax increase. So that, uh, that was a very fair observation and an important observation. I think the Japanese government has announced the right sorts of policies. That's not my criticism. My criticism is that it has to be implemented soon. And secondly, I should add that other policies apart from the ones you've mentioned, the Australia-Japan Free Trade Agreement is an important part of a structural reform program in Japan. So you know, that's, that's good news and that's, that's important, but really that these policies have to get it through the diet. and. I'm not a political scientist. I'll let others decide whether or not what's needed will actually get through. OK, thank you very much. And time is getting running up, but uh, we have uh, already lots of you know, requests. But uh, can we have uh, several you know, short questions? So Rod and uh, Jenny and uh, Peter. So sorry, all together, I'm sorry. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Rod Tyers from uh, UWA and the ANU. Uh, first question very quickly to uh, Professor Watanabe. Um, the uh, discussion that he gave us uh, about the transition to unconventional monetary policy in Japan um, is uh, uh, informative, but one of the th in bits of information that I'd like to hear more about is the effects on yields on long bonds. I mean, we know that the transition from conventional to unconventional monetary policy concerns um, the maturity of the assets that the central bank's buying. Um, and we know that there's a segmentation theory that tells us that the, the interest rates can move differently um, at different maturities. Um, the uh, the uh, yields on long bonds in Japan are comparatively low by global standards. Um, and uh, I'm curious to know just how much of a drop might have been caused by the, uh, the unconventional monetary policy. Uh, the second question concerns uh, uh, the consumption tax. Uh, some things you said in your presentation, uh, as well as perhaps some things that Warwick said later uh, about the consumption tax, suggested that uh, it, it might be thought of as an instrument of, uh, uh, of monetary policy, that is an instrument uh, to influence inflation. And uh, uh, it would seem to me that the principal objective of the consumption tax rise was uh, one of revenue generation and therefore fiscal balancing. Um, and that uh, the consumption tax is a comparatively efficient form of taxation um, in Japan, and, and that would have been justified entirely on microeconomic grounds. Um, so uh, the idea that, that we should worry about whether or not the effect of the, of the consumption tax on the price level should be permanent seems a little unusual to me. I'd also like to know whether it had an effect on, um, on uh, the government deficit. Do we observe that yet? Um, and do we observe a change in the current account deficit associated with the uh, consumption changes? Thank you. Okay. Jenny, please. Quick one to ask. Um, I'm afraid it would be a long one to answer, so I'll just leave it on the table. It's about ageing. And um, I'm interested to ask macroeconomists who work in terms of models, how we should be thinking about changing demographics in terms of the immediate and medium term macro responses to things like Abenomics. 
I thought the data from watanabe -san was very interesting about the differences between the age cohorts in their expectations of inflation. We know that different cohorts behave differently in lots of important ways. They save differently, they have different risk attitudes. So Warwick's point that you know, whether this will succeed or not will partly come down to people's expectations and their behavior may have to do with the age uh, structure of the economy. And I just wonder, as economists, how we should be building that in and dealing with it. Uh, two great uh, presentations and an excellent discussion. Uh, the takeaway message clearly is that Abenomics works as a package, but it won't work if one or other of the elements drop out. And the second takeaway point is, uh, as Warwick said, timing is everything. Uh, uh, I think when you look at uh, uh, both presentations, uh, uh, there are questions about uh, performance uh, uh, on delivery uh, of the elements and on timing. Uh, in respect of delivery and timing, I wonder if uh, what another what another sensei or Warwick would like uh, to respond to uh, your judgments about what tolerances we have uh, in terms of performance on both the timing and delivery of the second and perhaps the, th uh, the second and uh, certainly the third element of the package. Okay, you have only minus two minutes to respond. <laughs> so what okay, so maybe two minutes, uh, three minutes of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, uh, let, let me respond to the question about uh, uh, JGBEUs. Okay. Um, um, Yes, it, 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 um, so QQE impacted a lot on, 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 on the JG, nominal JGB yields. And uh, by the way, we, we di uh, so probably um, Governor Shirakawa told something about his policy during his term. He, he, they, they, they did something like QE. However, what they did was to buy uh, JGBs with very short maturities. They bought, actually, they bought um, uh, JGB with uh, um, less than one year or two year maturities. And that those JGBs are almost uh, um, substitutable with, with money. So that, that, was, that is why um, JGBs did not respond at, uh, almost at all to their policy. However, uh, Governor Kuroda um, made a clear uh, distinction between the, the previous policy say, by saying that they will, buy, they will try to um, buy JGB with, more, less, more, uh, with, with the average maturity of seven years. So they tr try to go to the uh, uh, JGB, ma JGB market with longer maturities. And that is why their policy affected a lot on, on JGB years. I, I, I have no um, concrete number for, for that, but pr right now uh, JGB years is less than 1%. And probably uh, most of the, those, uh, um, most of the, uh, the reason why this is so low is coming from the BOJ policy. And so this is a good thing to, 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 uh, to stimulate the economy. However, this is a bad thing because this is uh, the, the, now the uh, fiscal authority has uh, less incentive to uh, uh, reconstruct the fiscal situation in, this, in, in Japan. So uh, we should not continue this thing uh, for a long time. We, we should go back to the normal situation in the near, uh, in the near future as, as, as much as possible. Just very quickly, um, on, on the aging and the demographics, the Japanese cabinet office in 2002 sponsored a global project called the Collaborations Project, which I did work with Ralph Bryan on putting demographics into our modelling framework. It's very complex. There is a series of volumes which have the up, at that point the state of the art on how to deal with the ageing issues. Um, and I should mention, and, and it, it makes a difference, and it's important, and we published quite a few papers on this, but there is a, there is a conference, the Academy of Social Science are having a, a round table on ageing on November the 11th. It's a full day conference, I think in the Shine Dome, and I'm presenting some of our early demographics from a global perspective at that meeting. But I would definitely look at the various publications that were sponsored by the Japanese government. Again, they were ahead of the curve uh, in thinking about these things. On Peter's point, I think it's, it's a kind of endogenous on the tolerance, because if the world continues to sail along, along with all these problems out there, but no one panicking, then the Japanese government has more time. But if the whole world starts to unravel, as it has been for the last few days, uh, they're going to have to get their fiscal positions in, in, in place incredibly quickly. Probably just right off the debt would be easier, because then, then it's contained within Japan, and the Bank of Japan will go down in history as the inflationary um, 
consequences of that, but that's an extreme example of what might have to happen in a panic. But at the moment, I would have thought things would have unfolded before now, so I can't predict timing. Okay, thank you for your participation in an active discussion. And uh, I'm sorry I cannot answer, you know, about all the questions. But uh, please join me thanking the uh, presenters for their great presentation.